Welcome to the Real Estate Guys radio program. It is a scary, scary time of year, and real estate can be a scary business, but there are lessons to be learned. That's what we'll do today as we delve into our annual edition of Halloween Horror Stories, today on the Real Estate Guys radio program. Forbes rated Memphis the best cash flow market in the nation, and our good friend Terry Kerr at Mid-South Home Buyers has been the premier turnkey rental property provider in Memphis for over 13 years. With an A-plus rating for the Better Business Bureau, Terry has renovated over 750 houses. Real Estate Guys listeners have snapped up hundreds. Discover what these satisfied investors already know. Mid-South's properties are completely renovated with a one-year warranty and a lifelong rental guarantee. They're affordable, well-managed, and easy to own. Perfect for beginning investors and veterans alike. Get in on the action. Contact Terry and his team via email at midsouth at realestateguysradio.com. Hi, this is Patrick Donahoe of Paradigm Life. Wall Street and banks spend billions of dollars per year in advertising with the goal to convince you that they are the solution. But take a look around. None of their advice has worked. The number one concern of all Americans is still money. So are you ready for another way? I've spent the last 10 years teaching people like you a superior way to build wealth and financial independence outside of Wall Street. I've developed a free e-learning program called Infinite 101, where you can learn about the perpetual wealth strategy. In this free program, you'll learn how to build your wealth without a 401k, IRA, or mutual funds. You'll also learn how to establish private financing without ever having to walk into a bank again. These are just two of the many ways this free program can propel you toward financial independence. Simply go to paradigmlife.net and click on the register button on the top right corner of the page to gain instant access. Welcome to the frightfully popular Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. With me, our eerie co-host, Russell Gray. Hey, Robert. You know, every year, for many, many years, we've been delving into the ugliness of real estate, and that is what we call Halloween horror stories, things that go wrong, because in real estate, things will go wrong, and when they do, you have a couple choices. You can throw up your hands and say, poor, pitiful me, or you can get the lesson. And uh, many, many years ago, when we were doing our live mentoring club for real estate investors, Investors, we brought a bunch of case studies where things had gone poorly and delved into what went wrong, why it happened, what decisions could we have made, what decision did we make, and what lessons did we learn. And it became an annual thing we did at this live event where instead of presenting, you know, mostly positive case studies of possibilities of real estate, things that went wrong, and the most important part, lessons that you, you learned. And it became this cultural thing in our world of, of making sure you're looking at the bright side of bad things that happen. And now here we have uh, been on the radio many years doing Halloween Horror Stories. A few years back, we missed a year, and our listeners called us on it. So we're very happy that now what we do with Halloween Horror Stories is it's not just all of Russ and my terrible, awful real estate stories, but uh, lots of uh, listeners and friends that provide the stories for us. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we uh, we talk about it kind of being group therapy, but really it's real world. If you think about it, you go out every week to the mailbox or every month to the mailbox and you collect your rent checks and every once in a while you open up an envelope and there's a reality check <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, oh no. And uh, you know, the issue, I mean, we've been in real estate education for many, many years together and I've attended a lot of real estate education education before I became an educator myself, and I still do. And one of the things that I often see in most forms of training, especially when there's some upsell on the back end of it, is it's all sunshine and unicorns. It's right. all hope and opportunity. And that's great. And I think that's really important. You have got to go into real estate investing believing the best, believing it's going to work, believing you can do it and good things are going to happen to you. But the other side of that is, is the fact of the matter is every once in a while, something bad is going to happen. And by hearing a show like this, where you realize that bad things are happening to other people who are successful, who are very successful, makes you feel like you're not the only loser. You know, it's like, oh my God, I must be the biggest loser on earth because everybody else is sunshine and unicorns. And here it is. I've got this storm cloud over my head drenching me. What's wrong with me? Nothing. Nothing's wrong with you. Welcome to the real world. That's the way it is. And so the thing is that we talk about in everything in our business, we just got done doing a two day seminar. At the end, we turn out a survey. We ask everybody to give us the good, the bad and the ugly. Well, of course, the ugly is really what we're most interested in, believe it or not. We don't need people to sit there and tell us how great we are. And you know, we interviewed Donald Trump and what did you learn in the good times? Nothing. Right. I didn't learn anything. 
sometimes you learn in the good times where your character weaknesses are because you can afford to make mistakes, right? But you don't realize those mistakes are there until the bad times come. Yeah. And so it's the same thing true. If you've got holes in your portfolio, if you've got gaps in your business practices, if you have weak members on your team, if you have some oversight in your due diligence process, if there's some flaw in your business model, when something goes sideways, it's going to be exposed. But if you don't take the time to look at the survey, if you will, and do the plan, do review, in other words, what happened? You know, what could I have done knowing what I know now? And is it fair for me to be upset with myself or my team members because something went sideways, right? I mean, you can say, oh, well, if I would have known that was going to happen, I wouldn't have done that. But on the front end, did you have any possible way of knowing? Well, no, of course not. Would I have structured my portfolio the way I did going into 2008 if I knew that the greatest financial crisis in my lifetime was going to hit in the business, the very business I was in at the time? No. Well, of course not. No. Of course not. I felt like the biggest loser on earth when that happened. But... When I sat back and looked at it, I said, okay, you know what? I actually, I wasn't that unreasonable. But of course, knowing what I know now that that could happen, I pay a lot more attention to the signs that it, it's happening again. And I am much more conservatively structured to be able to weather that kind of a storm. So as bad as it was, I got a fabulous lesson. And I think there's going to be a lot of that in today's case studies. Well, and the folks you're going to hear from are all real life real estate investors who were gracious enough to share a bad experience with us. But going in, my whole preface to them was there's got to be a lesson. What was the lesson you learned? What did you glean? What made you a better investor because this happened? And that's the mindset that part. In fact, I remember a few years back when we did the live Halloween horror stories, the very next day I saw one of our investors and he said, oh, oh, guess what happened to me this morning? One of my properties, we had a big plumbing leak and, and I got pictures and next year it's going to be a Halloween horror story. Exactly. You know, the thing we talked about that because the training that we just did was our two day sales event. And one of the things we talked about was your mojo having this attitude. And so when you're talking to a customer, if you are in business and you're negotiating a deal, you're raising money and you're looking for an investor or you're negotiating a loan on a big deal and you're, or a buy sell agreement or whatever, and, the other, and you get rejected, you know, or they begin to object. They begin to say, oh yeah, but what about this? And yeah, but what about that? Right? Most salespeople, even if you don't consider yourself a salespeople, if you're in a transaction, you're a salesperson. All right. They just, oh my God, this is terrible. The person is objecting. I thought this was all going to be smooth. I have all my bullet points. I have my proposal down. This is all the reasons why it's a win-win. And all of a sudden, they're objecting. And you lose your mojo. When you have the attitude like, hey, bring it on. I'm glad you're engaging. I'm glad you at least care enough to ask the question. It's the same thing. So when a problem comes, if you have the attitude, great. It's going to be a great lesson. I, I got schooled in this by Robert Kiyosaki. He was going through a business divorce, right? We've known some people who have gone through that brutally difficult, right? hard. And so he was going through that situation. And my first words to him were empathetic. Oh, Robert, I'm so sorry to hear that. And he looked at me the way only Robert Kiyosaki <laughs> can. And he looked right through my eyes into my spine. Yes, you know? as he does. And, and he said, don't be, it's going to be great. The company's going to be better. My marriage is going to be better. I'm going to become a better businessman. This is fantastic. If you don't aren't stressed, you're not growing. This is going to make me better. Wow. And I was like, wow, I want to think like that. Yeah. It was inspiring. Well, it is. And when you know that there are other people who have been in the trenches, who have had things happen and they got through it, that can be uplifting as well. Real estate can be a lonely business. You're out there on your own chasing deals and, and working with tenants and contractors and all that stuff. And because it's a physical business, things do happen. And there's all kinds of things that happen. Every year's stories are different, but there's always great lessons in them. So when we come back, you're going to hear a whole bunch of things that went wrong and the lessons that our investors got. And you can get to on Halloween Horror Stories, this week on the Real Estate Guys radio program. Live nationwide, you're listening to the Real Estate Guys. Find out more at realestateguysradio.com. All aboard. Registration is now open for the Real Estate Guys 15th Annual Investor Summit at Sea. Imagine spending an entire week with like-minded investors, world-class educators, and real-world professionals. Returning in 2017 are sales legend Tom Hopkins, international developer Beth Clifford, attorney Mauricio Raul, commercial mortgage broker and syndicator Michael Becker, and the author of The Creature from Jekyll Island, G. Edward Griffin. Plus, joining us live and in person for his fifth investor summit, Peter Schiff. 
Plus, more to be announced. It all begins April 1st, 2017 in Houston, Texas. Visit realestateguysradio.com and click the tab that says Summit to learn more and reserve your spot. This transformational week is like no conference you've ever attended. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click Summit and make plans to spend a week with the Real Estate Guys and an all-star faculty on the 15th Annual Investors Summit at Sea. Hi, this is Chris Martinson, author of Prosper, and you are listening to The Real Estate Guys. Welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program and our annual edition of Halloween Horror Stories. Our first evil yarn is called The Case of the Disappearing Tenants. Here to recount this horrendous episode, let's welcome business owner and real estate investor, Dr. Buck Joffrey. Buck Tell us your Halloween horror story. So it all started out about uh, three or four years ago when I first bought my first apartment building. And I did this because I just read this great book from Robert Kiyosaki. And it told me I had to look at the numbers. And that's what I did. And it cash flow like crazy. And I was really excited about it. So I made the deal. And I was ready to collect my money. And had to get a new property manager because as it turned out that the property manager that was managing this business was an owner of several buildings in the area. Okay. Well, oddly enough, uh, a couple months later, I started to realize that there was very little rent coming in, very little money coming in anymore. There were tenants. There were. Well, in fact, it was a completely occupied building wow. apparently for over a year. Wow. Right. There just was something missing. Yes, there was something missing. In fact, what had apparently been happening is the uh, residents in that building were told they were being moved over to another building, and over time, they wouldn't have to pay rent. Nice. So basically what happened is I discovered the, the that the previous owner who had owned a number of buildings in the area had essentially had people moved over to that building just for the period of the sale. And then when the sale was over, those people were told that they didn't really need to pay rent. Nice. All right. So this is actually a fairly common. It's not always to this degree where they stuff the entire building full of non-paying uh, tenants. But very often you've got an asset to sell and it's not performing at its peak. And maybe that's why you want to get rid of it. It's a high profile type tenant and you, that's not what you want. A lot of, you know, C class and so forth. And, and so you figure, well, I'll, I'll give some rent assistance or abatement or something like that. But, uh, we, we actually had a, a building very similar, um, story and we got in there and it was pretty quick that not only were they not paying, most of the ones that weren't paying were related. It was like brothers and cousins and all this. So, uh, so you got a rent roll. So you saw the units were full. You probably did an inspection and you saw people were living there. Correct. So what you just didn't know is that there was the durability income of the income was in question. So Buck, what would you, what would you do looking, looking back, uh, having gone through that experience? What process would you go through now? Well, this was a class D building. Okay. So what that means is in effect, it was a, you know, it was a place where people didn't have a lot of credit or a lot of money. The reason that I bought it was because the numbers look so darn good. Well, yeah. of course they do, right? <laughs> a class D building that is, you know, completely filled. Usually those numbers look great. Right. So the first lesson for me is, and what I tell people who are starting to invest is don't invest in a class D building as your first project. Yeah. Because that takes a lot of experience. It can be done. People can make money, but you have to have a lot of experience to make it work. Second thing is to do a thorough due diligence on the property manager that you're going to have in place after purchase ahead of time and make sure that you know you have some sort of track record from that property manager of buildings in the area. And that's something I didn't do and I didn't know to do. And that's something that sticks with me to this day. So before I buy any property, I make sure that there's a property manager that tells me, I manage buildings in this area and I can keep this full. That's awesome. All right, a couple other things to consider in this. When you get a rent roll, and you always will as part of your due diligence process and part of the documentation that the seller gives you, you're going to go through and you're going to see does this make sense? When do they move in? What's their deposit? And how much are they paying in rent? Very oftentimes a building gets sold saying there's upside potential and you'll see that maybe there's some tenants who are paying less than market and that could be an opportunity to raise rents. But in a D-class building, you raise the rent $15, they're liable to move, right? So that's the first thing. But, but moreover, and this is an important concept, we always urge people to look not at the current tenant, but who's the tenant standing in line to rent? So to your point, and it's a great one, if the local property manager says, 
hey, I could fill this thing again if I had to. That's what you're looking for, not the existing tenant base. Now, one more thing, especially on bigger purchases, I wouldn't stop with a rent roll. If I know I'm going to do, say, rehab and I'm going to try to upgrade the tenant mix, then I'm not that concerned about the tenants in there right now. But if I'm relying on that income stream, uh, you can take it a step further than a rent roll and ask for what's called an estoppel. And an estoppel is a tenant's verification from their side that they're paying the rent. So it's filled out by the tenant. And typically, you would recommend that the existing landlord doesn't provide this, that a third party could be your prospective new manager, could be you, go and, and knock on the door and you do this with permission because of the tenant landlord law and you say hi and the building's in escrow and we just would like you to verify the facts that we've been shown, what their deposit is on record, what their monthly rent is, how long since their last increase. And they just simply say, yes, that's right. That doesn't mean that you wouldn't have one of these dishonest tenants going, oh, uh, no, yeah, that's fine, right? Because that's essentially, they're just confirming those are the facts. That might have uncovered in this case, right? Oh, no, no, I was told we didn't have to pay any rent, right? So my goodness, I'm sure that's a lesson that uh, continues to help you in your investing today. Absolutely. A little bit of scar tissue goes a long way. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, Buck, before we get you out of here, uh, one thing I wanted to uh, make sure the listeners know is you have a brand new podcast. Tell us about your podcast. I do. It's called the Wealth Formula Podcast, and it's really focused on people who make a lot of money and who are trying to learn uh, a little bit about how to invest. And it's not just on real estate, although you have a lot of real estate backgrounds on businesses. You've done successful businesses. We haven't talked much about you. We, I'm sure we will in the future. You're a successful doctor, a, a lot there. But it's it's this idea that wealth takes lots of forms. And once you have wealth, you need to be a steward of that wealth and grow that wealth and protect that wealth. That's exactly right. All right. Excellent. Well, check out that fine podcast for all. Great podcasts are podcasts. Thanks, Buck. Thank you. Halloween Horror Story number two for this year is called What's Buried Beneath. Let's say hello to Mike Ayala. How are you, Mike? Great. How are you? I'm good. Other than our spooky show today with all the things that have gone wrong, you have uh, quite a story. You do a lot in the mobile home space. So you have mobile home parks. You've been management. I've uh, done a lot in uh, in real estate. Happy to uh, have you uh, on the show today. Tell us your Halloween horror story. Yeah. So on the first mobile home park that we had purchased, uh, as, as we were going through doing due diligence, we'd kind of checked into everything and thought we'd done a pretty good job. But once we bought the park and you know started operating it, um, wintertime came around and we started having uh, a lot of the mobile home units that didn't have water to them. So as we started looking into it, uh, the previous owner, whenever he would have a water issue, uh, he'd dig up the line and he would attach a garden hose to it and then dig a six inch deep trench and, and run it to the, the mobile home. Wow, nice. So you did your test, you did your inspection and the water worked. Yep. And you thought, well, okay, well, it seems like there's water to every unit. That's a good, let's check the box. What you didn't realize is that buried beneath the soil was instead of hiring a plumber, <laughs> this guy brought garden hose over. All right, well, let's, let's talk about the ugliness first. What, what did you have to do to fix the problem? Yeah, so we knew at some point in time we were probably going to have to upgrade the infrastructure of this park. Um, it was pretty old, so we just had to accelerate that. And so we uh, limped through the winter and... First, as soon as spring came around, we uh, repiped the entire park, and it was about a seventy-five thousand dollars repipe. But like I said, we had kind of planned for it, but just not that soon. So. All right. Well, when you buy a, a mobile home park, you're, you're definitely looking at infrastructure because depending on the model, sometimes I know you own the homes, and sometimes you don't. The tenant on the land owns the homes. Correct. For the most part, we try not to own the homes, but. It is our infrastructure, so. Right, so it's important that you have the infrastructure, and in this case, uh, really important. Okay, so now that that's happened to you, what was the lesson? Well, the biggest lesson is is to realize that a lot of times these mobile home parks are operated by what we call a mom and pop or a maintenance guy that you know didn't necessarily know what he was doing. They oftentimes don't hire professionals. So uh, we dig a little deeper now and, and literally. always, yeah, 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 yeah literally, yeah, that's awesome. And we always budget a little bit more for these kind of uh, hidden problems. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's when you look at any, any real estate deal at all, you're looking at the surface level and the whole idea of due diligence is, hey, if it all ends up looking like we thought, then it's go it's a go. And if not, well, we're going to back out because of the inspection. But you would think that just turning on the lights and turning on the water and making sure it all worked would be far enough. In this case, not right ounce of prevention. So I would think 
think that, especially because infrastructure is so important in your business, that as you, you know, you're going to have a good idea about a budget for what the replacement is. Uh, maybe it's just digging deeper, as you say, to figure out, well, what's the true current condition and how soon are we going to have to put that CapEx into our model? That's correct. And the other thing that we've learned, too, is to... Uh, you know, a lot of times the the sub water supply lines coming up out of the ground, the sewer system, take a little deeper look, uncover them, unwrap the insulation, make sure it's not a garden hose. There you go. All right, good. Well, Mike, thanks for your Halloween horror story. That's an ugly one. Thanks for having me. Such devilish delight. Our next foul fable is called, What's That Smell? Let's meet the person behind this Halloween horror story. It's real estate investor and real estate broker, Randy Hubbs. Hey, Randy. Hey, doing good, Robert. Yeah, excellent. Well, I know everything in real estate goes well most of the time, but uh, like many folks who've been investing uh, many, many years, like yourself, you've been in single family, multifamily, resort property, lots of different things. Uh, not everything goes right every time. And you have a really unique Halloween horror story because it's a successful rental with a twist. So tell us your Halloween horror story. Sure. The only rental I still have today, which is the very first one I ever bought, my two bedroom, one bath home that uh, has had the same tenant in it for now 28 years. And she's like my grandma. So I couldn't hand her off to property management, but her kids take care of everything. And so I don't ever get those calls. The checks come in, everything's wonderful. And uh, I finally got a call one day that, that there was a funny smell in the house. And uh, this house has a almost a cold cellar underneath it and sent my person to go over there and check it out only to find out that the plumbing had fallen apart underneath the kitchen sink and there had been water dumping in there for who knows how many months and so we had a a little bit of a mess things had sloughed off we had foundation issues uh, fortunately not around the house but uh, all the supports it had to be all completely redone okay so she turns the sink on and the stuff goes down there and it's all fine except that it's all deteriorated pretty soon it's pouring right down into the foundation and it's just oh wow terrible terrible stuff but there's a couple of great lessons in here so first of all the fact that everything else in your portfolio you have professionally managed. Correct. But you've hung on to this one because, you know, it was your first property and you know her and she hasn't moved in all these years and that's all good, right? So maybe, I don't know if there's a lesson in there or not about management, but um, what are the lessons that you got uh, from for going through this situation? Sure, but e even as a broker, I've ran into this too. And, and that is who wants to crawl underneath and look at your crawl space or go up in the attic and inspect regularly. But if you don't do that, that can be become a real issue. And furthermore, insurance only covers water losses if they're a sudden water loss. And of course, this was not. So that right. was all, all on me as the owner to fix. Wow. Okay. A couple of really distinct things to point out here. This is, this is a great one because everything's going along well. doesn't seem like there's a big problem. Finally, it gets so bad that she calls and says, you know, something smells funny. So typically when you hire a property manager, they're in, in residential, also what we consider an asset manager. They're going to take care of any major work that has to be done. And, and most will go out and inspect the property. A lot of folks listening and own property in states they don't live in or countries they don't live in. So you need a, a third party property manager who's in the area local and that person hopefully goes out and occasionally takes a check of the house now is that person going to go through everything and how often would you do that especially this is like the landlord complacency thing hey everything's going well i got the same tenant she takes great care of the place her kids take care of the place certainly if something would happen they they would notice but tenants think differently right well i, I remember once we we did a walkthrough on a, a fiveplex we were listing and there was uh, we we're walking through with the owners and they self-managed and there was a drip and it was just a drip in the shower. And we looked and not only had the drip gone in the shower, uh, there was a leak underneath the tub and there was water damage in the ceiling below from the, on the second floor or the lower floor. And this has been going on forever. And the owner says to the, to the tenant, how long has this been happening? Oh, it's been about a year. And she said, well, why didn't you say anything? He goes, well, it's okay. We, we don't mind. Well, that's not the point. The point is had they called right away, right? But we can't expect tenants 
to act the same way as owners. Exactly. And of course, you know, going over to find a bucket underneath the sink just because they didn't want to inconvenience you as the owner is not always a good measure because that bucket can, of course, overflow. Yes. And, and will left unchecked for sure. So I think a couple of things, obviously, yet need good communication with the tenants so they know, hey, we're here to service you. And this may sound ironic to some of you because they're always calling and bugging you, but that's what you want. You would much rather have heard earlier than later in this case. Absolutely. You know, they are your customer. They're not, uh, I also happen to be on a board for a local rental association and a lot of people look at the, the, the tenants, they'll call them. We like to call them residents or I even heard this weekend, customers, yeah. which is exactly what they are. Um, they, they tend to look at them as being a burden when in fact they're the ones that are putting those checks in the mail and taking, so they deserve to be taken care of. Well, they sure do. And they just need to understand that expectation that, hey, if anything doesn't seem right, give us a call. We're happy to take care of it. Yeah, that means sometimes you're driving out there to change a light bulb or your property manager is, uh, but it's that expectation part. The ounce of prevention, right, had you addressed this earlier, it would have been not only cheaper, it would have been a better better thing for the tenant and, and for the property and all that. So, uh, well, thanks for sharing your horror with us today and uh, good luck in your continued investment. All right. Well, thank you, Robert. Absolutely. It's Halloween Horror Stories today on The Real Estate Guys, things that went desperately wrong and the lessons we learned today on The Real Estate Guys radio program. Real estate investment advice right in your mailbox. Sign up for the free Real Estate Guys newsletter at realestateguysradio.com. If you want to retire in the next five years or less through real estate, then please pay close attention. My name is Brad Sumrock, and I've taught thousands of my students how to replace their incomes, quit their jobs, and retire faster than they ever thought possible by not investing in single family homes. You see, there's a secret to retiring fast with little risk, and it has nothing to do with being a landlord, fixing toilets, or flipping houses. The secret is multifamily apartment buildings. Starting from scratch with zero experience, I managed to pocket over $1 million in cash and retire from my 17 year corporate job within three years of apartment investing. Now, this is not your typical no money down real estate training. We believe in smart, hard work for intelligent people. So if you're good with your finances, have a decent job or saving your money, and you're looking for a change and getting out of the rat race, then investing in apartment buildings might just be the answer you've been looking for. Send an email right now to sumrock at realestateguysradio.com to get the details of my upcoming training event and you'll also receive my free training webinar, Apartment Investing for Beginners. That's sumrock, S-U-M-R-O-K, at realestateguysradio.com. Are you ready to profit in paradise? Hi, it's Robert Helms. And if you think real estate investing means tenants, toilets, and termites, think again. Located just a short plane ride from the U.S., a virtually untouched paradise awaits. The beautiful country of Belize. When you go to Belize with the Real Estate Guys, you'll spend four fabulous days discovering one of the most intriguing real estate markets I've ever seen. With its jungle rainforests, pristine beaches, and 81-degree turquoise water, Belize is one of the most beautiful places on Earth. Plus, it's considered one of the top seven tax havens in the world. Belize property is on the rise and many experts think the best is yet to come but don't just take my word for it come experience Belize firsthand at our upcoming investor field trip when you join us you'll discover the many reasons we love Belize like tremendously undervalued beachfront land super low taxes ease of doing business and so much more get the details at realestateguysradio.com just click on events see paradise for yourself click events at realestateguysradio.com and I'll see you in beautiful Belize Hi, this is Simon Black from Sovereignman.com, and you're listening to The Real Estate Guys. Welcome back to this bone-shattering edition of The Real Estate Guys radio program. It's our annual Halloween Horror Story edition. Things that are nearly too terrible to mention, but we need to know about them because there are lessons to be learned. Before we get back to this revolting recounting, it's time to play Real Estate Trivia. That's your chance to win a prize by knowing today's Real Estate Trivia question. In just a minute, I'm going to give you a real estate trivia question that, of course, has something to do with real estate and ghastliness. 
What you're going to do is as soon as you hear the question and think you might know the answer, send us your best guess to trivia at realestateguysradio.com. That's trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Include your name, the answer to the question, and your physical mailing address so that if you are the blood-curdling winner, we're going to send you a copy of Second Chance, the latest book by Robert Kiyosaki. Before I give you this week's question, last week on the show, we had Greg Bond from Orlando, Florida. In fact, something tells me we just might hear from Mr. Bond again this week with a Halloween horror story. At any rate, our question last week was this. There are lots of theme parks in Orlando. Which one was the first? Well, believe it or not, the first theme park in Orlando was Gatorland. Yep, Gatorland was the first theme park to open in Orlando in 1949. Its main attraction was a 15-foot alligator said to be the biggest in the world. Here's our chilling real estate trivia question for this week. Stephen King's inspiration for the book The Shining came from staying at which hotel? Yep, Stephen King and his wife stayed at this particular hotel and it gave him all of the ideas and inspiration for the scary, scary, scary book The Shining. Which actual hotel was it? If you know or just want to take a guess, send us your best guess to trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Include your name and your mailing address so that if you're the winner, we can send you a copy of Robert Kiyosaki's Second Chance. That's today's real estate trivia question. It's Halloween horror stories this week. Things that have gone wrong with real estate investors and the lessons they and you can learn. This perilous parable is called, What Could Possibly Go Wrong? <laughs> <laughs> For more mysterious mayhem, let's say hello to a gentleman with investing and syndication experience in both real estate and oil and gas. Mr. Paul Anthony Thomas, how are you? I'm fine. Great. Thanks for having me well, today. Well, we've had you at a lot of events. Good to uh, see you today, and thanks for uh, taking time to share your Halloween horror story. I appreciate your time. Now, what's happened uh, in uh, in your story? Get, uh, tee us up and uh, and tell us the deal. Well, in the late 1970s, I was uh, learning how to syndicate for my father and working with him in the oil and gas business, and also and we were in the real estate business as well. Back, back in that time, the, the market was just hot with uh, water parks. Yep. Water parks were just a tremendous uh, program, uh, lots of developments around the country. Uh, Wet n' Wild was the big player, and another uh, big focus at that time was what they call outlet malls. Sure. So I was located about two hours west of Fort Worth, which is kind of a typical area, two hours away from a major metropolitan city on a, on a major thoroughfare interstate. And sure. I thought, man, this is a slam dunk. We can do this deal. We can. I've got the land. I can work this deal out and make it development for the city of Abilene, which is where I'm from, Abilene, Texas. Yeah. Uh, it's out in the Permian Basin. And we uh, can make a development for Abilene that will be just kind of a stellar development for the country and show show the country how to do this deal. So, so a combination outlet mall and water park. Right. And like the one, kids can be at the water park. The parents can be shopping. Sounds great. We thought it was great. Oh, yeah. yeah. We thought it was wonderful. And, and I put the deal together, spent about $50,000 on plans and another $50,000 on incidentals. I had a company called Leisure and Recreation Concepts to do me a feasibility study. And they thought they thought it was a great idea. Of course, anytime you pay for a feasibility study, you're going to they're going to tell you what you want to hear. So they did. And I, I took that feasibility study and I, I said, you know, this doesn't quite all gel together. I need to go visit somebody that knows something about outlet malls. Yeah. So I made an appointment with the head of the, the major outlet mall developer in the United States. He actually was in Dallas at the time. He, he was from Ohio and he uh, was in Dallas and he was gracious enough to give me an hour of his time. And I went and I laid out my plans and I laid out the whole program for him. And, and uh, he said, you know, Paul, I really, really admire your ambition and, and, you know, the, your location's great. That, that's, that's, that's a good idea, but your population sucks. You, you're never going to be successful. You don't have the right, right mix of properties and, and population and traffic to make this deal work. Right. And, Not and, quite enough population in the area for the retailers there to be successful. That's right. That's right. And without the retail, the deal wouldn't, would not work. And yeah. the water park would not work either because the same demographics applied to the water park that applied to the, the outlet mall. So, so not the news you wanted to hear after spending a hundred grand. That's right. No, not at all. And it was a valuable lesson to me. So well, let's talk about that side because this is what's huge is that in every cloud, there's a silver lining. So 
Uh, what were the lessons that came out of this for you? Ever since that time, I have, before I spend any appreciable amount of money, I consult experts. Yeah. I consult people, and that helps me be an expert. Once, once I determine how somebody identifies the opportunities and analyzes the opportunities, then you can start studying that, that model, and, and how the successful people do it. Yeah. And once you do that, then you, become, you can actually become an expert in, in the different fields. And I, over my career, that was in the 19, late 1970s, I was 20 years old when yeah. I was doing this. Today, I'm 60 years old. So now I've done that dozens and hundreds, actually hundreds of times over yeah. the last 20 years. 40 years now. Well, so it sounds like amortized, that was a pretty good, uh, pretty affordable lesson. It was. It was. It was a lot of money for me at the time, yeah. but, but today it, it's, it serves me well, and, and I, I have a, a myriad of experts around the country that I talk to routinely when I have a new project, and, and it's actually helped me become an expert in lots of fields. You know? Well, you know, one of the things that we always say is that you don't know what you don't know. In this case, you had a great idea, a great concept, and in another location, that could have been a brilliant concept, but somebody in the know points out what to them was obvious and to you wasn't at the time. You know, you just don't quite have enough people in your town to sustain this type of use. Today, that's probably one of the fundamental things you would look at before pulling the trigger on a, that's on a deal. A, that's exactly right. The fundamental, uh, there's our fund, that's the fundamental questions that you want to ask is, are you going to be successful? You know, is, is, the, is the success even obtainable in the location you're considering? All right. Well, good stuff, my friend. Thank you so much for sharing your Halloween horror story. We're going to get you back on the air and talk about uh, what you do in your other life because there's some great stuff going on there. But uh, with Halloween coming up, we thought uh, this would be a great time to uh, get uh, some of those lessons learned because we don't have to learn from the things we do ourselves. We can learn vicariously up through others, and hopefully the listeners uh, can, can glean some wisdom from your pain and misfortune. Well, I hope so. I hope they do, and I appreciate that. Well, we hope the audience is appreciating this year's Halloween Horror Stories scintillating stuff. Now, sit back and enjoy an appalling account known as the Dreadful Cut. Our next terrifying tale comes to us from our great Canadian friend, Victor Minash. Victor, welcome back to the show. Great to be here. Well, you're a developer, an investor, and I knew you'd have a great Halloween horror story. So tell us your, uh, your tale of woe. Well, this is a project that we're building in Philadelphia right now. And it's an 11-unit building. And the lesson here is you've got to have the right people in the right chairs on the job. That's... That's the lesson. So let me tell you what happened. Yeah. This is a building where there's very little parking in Philadelphia. So we wanted to build structured parking on the ground level, elevate the building up on the second, third, and fourth floor. Makes sense. So let's set up the picture. You're driving in from the street. You've got a curb in the way. So you got to get over the curb, cross the sidewalk, and into the driveway. So in order to do that, you need to cut the curb. That's called a curb cut. And in order to get one of those, you have to get permission from the city to cut the curb. That's part of the zoning application. Yep. What the rule says is if you are sharing three or more properties on a single driveway, you qualify. If you have less than three, you do not qualify. We were consolidating three lots to build this building, so we said, okay, we qualify. And our architect, his interpretation of the building code and the zoning code was exactly that, that we would qualify for the, for the curb cut. We designed the building, we did all our construction drawings, we submitted our zoning application, and lo and behold, we failed. Why? Because the city said as soon as you consolidate the three lots into a single lot, now it's one lot, not three, and you no longer qualify. Wow. So now we have a beautifully designed building and we have failed our zoning application. So they said, well, what do we do now? You can go to zoning and you can file an appeal. So we contacted our zoning attorney, started to go through the process of amassing the information and all of the evidence to put together our appeal to the zoning board. And this is a multi-month process, as you can imagine. This was going to be a you know a, a lengthy process. Of course, time is money, and we're losing time and losing money. Right. We get almost to the point where we're about to go through the to the zoning appeal, and the zoning officer asks a question. By the way, is this a condo building? And we said, Why do you ask? Good question. <laughs> well, of course, if it's a condo building, this would be separate eleven separately deeded units, which is more than three. Yes. And so we would now all of a sudden qualify. So it's simply just that little, like Tony Robbins talks about, those two millimeters right. that take you from having a problem to hitting the bullseye. And we said, why, yes, as a matter of fact. <laughs> it certainly is. <laughs> it certainly is. And it is. 
And so now we have an 11 unit condo building and the cost of registering the condo building is not very, very high. It's like extra $8,500. So you write a check versus maybe $15,000 in legal fees and multiple months worth of additional delay to go through the process. So what is the lesson here? We had an architect, you know, you often hire an architect based on creativity. That's the one thing that they use to differentiate themselves. But in reality, that's really only about a third of the job. The majority of the job is navigating their way through the zoning code, through the building code, and really threading the needle through all the various constraints that come down to successful project execution. Because at the end of the day, it's about execution. Now, of course, nobody wants a, a building that looks like a shipping container with windows. Right. You, know, you want you want something that's going to have some curb appeal and some design sensibility, both form and function. And so, you know, you're going to get that with your architect. But how do, when you evaluate your architect, are you evaluating them for those other skills? And how do you even test for that? That's the critical question. Well, in this case, I'm quite certain that now your reticular activator is much more aware on this and probably your architects as well, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Now, now, a couple of things, though. In, in case folks didn't hear uh, when we had you on the show a few months back, this product type is one that you hold and keep as an apartment building. That's exactly right. However you're not looking to sell them individually as condominium. It can't hurt to have individual condominium title. You have spent some money, but you're going to spend some money anyway. So now you arguably have an asset with now even a, one more possible exit strategy. That's exactly right. So yes, we are going to be the owners of all 11 units in the condo. We will have controlling share of the condo corporation. And so, you know, the votes are going to be very, not very dramatic. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> so yes, there's a little bit of additional annual overhead, but yes, these are, these are buildings that we are holding for the long term. They are essentially rental properties. And as you said, by the fact that they're now individually deeded, we have multiple exit strategies. We could we could sell a unit or two if we want to raise some cash. And you have a different entrance strategy, which is not to have your tenants jump the curb every time <laughs> they get to use the driveway. So awesome stuff. Uh, thanks, Victor, My for sharing your Halloween horror story. Can you even stand the continued creepiness? Okay, then our last Halloween horror story before the break is entitled, A Luxurious Disaster. Well, a couple of weeks back, you had a chance to meet Bond, Greg Bond. Greg is an investor and uh, turnkey provider in Orlando, Florida, and uh, he's back with us today. Hey, Greg. Hey, Robert. Thanks for having me back. My goodness, that's twice in a month. I love it. Hey, you know, um, one of the things you talked about in our interview, and if you haven't heard the interview with Greg, go back and, and hear it because you'll learn some great things about what he does in the market, how he sources inventory that's hard for people to find, and also your market, Orlando, which is great. But you touched on this story, and I thought, wow, that's actually a pretty amazing Halloween horror story if you will, not physically in terms of something going wrong with the property, but instead a, a mindset and the results. So share with us your Halloween horror story. Well, Robert, uh, I had an opportunity. It was a uh, it was a rather large luxury home, six bedroom, five and a half bath, uh, about 4,000 square feet, pool home, three car garage, gated community. Nice. Uh, so just this uh, wonderful home. It, it, it had been stripped down. And, you know, it was a typical uh, one of the foreclosures and somebody went in and ripped out the kitchen, ripped out all the vanities, ripped all the ceiling fans. So there was nothing left. The floor was damaged. And I thought, you know, I can buy this right. Boy, I can make some money on this. I can just take the crews that are doing my other work. We can bring them in. We can do this work and I'll flip this property out. And, uh, and so just in case you don't know and didn't hear the interview, what Greg does is he buys rental stock housing that needs work, fixes it up, tenants it up, puts tenants in it, makes some margin and has a great opportunity for investors. But this was beyond the scope. Obviously, this isn't a rental home. No, this is, de this is definitely not a rental home, Robert. <laughs> so uh, I, I got into it and I pretty much did my numbers like I would do a rental home. Yeah. Well, not understanding everything that goes into a luxury home, the additional cost for the flooring, the additional cost for the kitchen, the additional cost for the bathroom, the uh, the fixtures. I mean, it just went on and on and on. And I start adding up these numbers and I'm going, wait a minute, there's going to be no profit here. And then on top of that, I'm not used to using a realtor, not I'm opposed to using a realtor. I, I use a lot of realtors to find properties, but uh, now I'm paying 6% because I'm not the I'm not the buyer or the seller. Right. Now I've built in 6% of that on top of everything else. So both realtors ended up making more than I made on the deal. Wow. It was, uh, it, you know, I made about $10,000 on this deal and it was just a disaster. All right. So $10,000 may not sound like a horror story to you, but here's the reality of it. The return on your time compared to what else you could do at that time. Yes, Robert, I probably could have completed five 
rental homes in that same time frame. And then it was just, it, it's a different learning curve. It's a different market. It's a different, and I just didn't understand the difference between those two markets. Now I do, and I'm a little bit more hesitant. Even if a deal comes true like that, let somebody else have it. All right, this is awesome because to me, this is what personal investment philosophy is all about. Getting crystal clear on what is a good deal for you. You're very successful in what you do in your business. You have a lot of rental property. You understand that business, and you certainly have the construction chops to go turn a ugly duckling into a nice home. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to make financial sense because you veered a little bit from from your core competency. Exactly, and I uh, I will not do that again. The great thing about experience is that very thing. You know what? If this had cost you ten thousand dollars, it'd probably be a good lesson. So I guess it would right? be a great lesson. All right. Hey, if you haven't had a chance to uh, order the report, uh, Greg put a great report together on the Orlando market. So just a quick aside, go uh, send an email to Orlando at realestateguysradio.com and uh, you can learn about that. Well, thanks for your humility in that story and sharing your Halloween horror story. I believe your second Halloween horror story with the Real Estate Guys. Absolutely. All right. Good stuff. There's Greg Bond. More when we come back. You're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. It's Halloween Horror Stories today. Need help with your real estate investment portfolio? Check out the resources page at realestateguysradio.com. If you love real estate and have always wanted to own your own business, listen up. The Real Estate Guys and their panel of experts want to teach you how to go full-time fast in the real estate syndication business. These next few years may go down in history as one of the best times ever to acquire investment real estate. There are deals everywhere if you know where to look and how to assemble the resources. The Secrets of Successful Syndication Seminar will show you how to make big money doing big deals from a team of experts that have syndicated projects totaling more than $1 billion. Don't wait for someone to give you a raise or create a job for you. Attend the secrets of successful syndication and learn how to build a team, raise capital, find deals, and make full-time money in six months or less. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click on events. All the big players use syndication as a way to diversify risk, optimize profits, and earn big money. You can too. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click on events. Are you achieving everything you want in life? What if there was a time-tested way for you to get everything you've dreamed of? The most successful people in life set goals and keep themselves accountable. But how? The good news is that it's not rocket science. You too can learn the skills and unleash the motivation that will create success in your life. And now is the time. Hi, this is Robert Helms. I'd like to personally invite you to attend Create Your Future, the 2017 Goals Retreat, January 6th through 8th in beautiful San Diego, California. This unique weekend has been called phenomenal, inspirational, and life-changing by the hundreds of people that have attended. Find out more at realestateguysradio.com and click events or call 888-489-7723, extension 18. Get your life back on track physically, spiritually, and financially. Attend the 2017 Goals Retreat on the first weekend of the new year. Click events at realestateguysradio.com to register. This is no dress rehearsal. Live the life you were meant to. Visit realestateguysradio.com or call 888-489-7723, extension 18, today. Hi, this is Darren Hardy, author of The Compound Effect, and you're listening to The Real Estate Guys. Welcome back to our annual Erie edition of The Real Estate Guys radio program. It's Halloween horror stories, terrible things that happen to investors, but lessons they've learned. The next alarming antidote is called A Great Deal Indeed. Well, it's not every year we get a return guest on the program, but uh, welcome back with his second Halloween horror story, Dr. Eric Date. How are you, Eric? Great, great. Great to have you back. I guess I haven't really figured this thing out completely. Well, the more, you know, here's the thing. The longer you're in real estate, the more this kind of stuff's going to happen. And of course, you always get the lesson, which is great. You're a great student and a great practitioner, but not everything goes right every single time. Tell us this year's Halloween Horror Story. Yeah, I got a little sloppy in my own account. This wasn't any money from investors that we had brought in, but uh, I had a little house that I was looking to rent. Some tenants came over, prospective tenants. They said that their house was being sold because the gentleman was sick. To me, that was an opportunity, so I called him and see if we could work something out. He just needed $10,000 to, to, to kind of take care of some bills, and he was going to deed the house over to me. So I would just make the payments. 
the mortgage would stay in his name, and then I would just rent the house up and fix it up. And so we struck a deal. So well, let's stop for a minute. This is interesting because you knew the tenant; they were renting a house already. It was that owner of the house that had the, the challenge, and you saw this as an opportunity to you know turnkey tenant built in. Absolutely. absolutely. Sounds great. And okay. So, and for $10,000, he's willing to sign it over to you. Absolutely. And so we did the paperwork. We didn't use a title company because we weren't changing the mortgage out of his name and the title company wasn't willing to do it. Probably my mistake, number one. <laughs> and so we did all the paperwork. We had everything. I had an attorney draw up the documents, but not through a title company. And then I had the deed and then life got in the way and I just got busy and I got busy and I got busy. And lo and behold, six months later, my tenants get a knock at the door saying that, oh, you have to leave. This house has been sold. Really? Okay. And so I called the, the gentleman and I, well, I went to the county register and saw that a deed had been filed and I realized, oh my goodness, I hadn't filed my deed yet. Wow. So I called the seller and he really just wanted to extort more money out of me. That's really all this was. And so yeah. I had to get my attorney involved and we worked it out and you know, I had to pay a little bit more money to him. So I did get extorted, but all is well that ended well because I had, a, I had an enforceable contract. I had the deed. I had the deed, and you know the the lesson that I learned there was cross your T's and dot your I's at all times. Don't let life get in the way. The thing you're working on, take it to completion. Even if it's in your own account, don't get sloppy in your own account. That's such a good lesson. Well, and in this case, right? Had you simply recorded the deed, there would have been no issue. Correct. He didn't really sell to somebody else. He was just trying to figure out a way to get some property into another 10 grand and one rent, right? So we go into every transaction assuming the best of the other person, but preparing for the worst. So good point. And this is a situation where he had an attorney involved. All the front end stuff was done right. It's just that one little extra step that it takes. Now, the other point of it is, and it's a good point. You're a guy who raises capital and you do deals where you have this different relationship with folks. And it's not only your money, you put some of your money into deals, but you raise money also. And folks who syndicate money like that, we're very careful with the money, very, you know, I dotting and T crossing because it's our job. We've been entrusted as stewards of the money. But every now and then we get lazy on our own stuff. Right? Yes, absolutely. When, you know, when, you, when you're doing your own, th it's interesting. I found that people will take more risks with their own capital than when they are stewards of other people's capital or when they have other people who are depending upon them. Yeah. And this, is, this was just a good lesson for me to always have the checklist, irrespective of whether or not this is we're doing outside projects with outside investors money, which we always have everything kind of what we call well papered, everything T is crossed, I is dotted versus okay, even in my own account, all right, what, what am I not doing well in my own life that no one else is involved with and making sure that I'm running that at, at its maximum capacity as well? Well, and knowing a little bit about the kind of projects you do, a little single family house like this is a pretty small deal. So it's easy to go, ah, it's not that big of a deal, but everything's a big, you treat it like a business. Every piece of real estate is important, right? I think Brian Tree said everything counts. Everything counts. Hey, before I let you get out of here, uh, let me put you on the spot. Uh, coming up, we have uh, Creating Your Future, our annual goals retreat. And uh, you've been to it uh, three times now? Three or four. One of the two. I'm not sure at this point. All right. So uh, tell the folks why they ought to consider coming out to uh, the goals retreat. Oh, it's it's transformational. I, I that is the one thing that I, I send more people to that I speak with, potential investors that I talk with who aren't kind of clear about what they want in, in their life. Creating your future will get you ultimate clarity around not just one thing in your life, not just your financial goals, not just your personal goals, not just your spiritual goals. It's a holistic process through which you're figuring out what's most important to you across multiple levels. And I can't recommend it highly enough. All right. Well, thanks for that. And thanks for sharing your Halloween horror story. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Next up, it's a nasty narrative entitled The Necessary Decapitation. <laughs> this tale of woe comes from our good friend, Terry Kerr from Memphis, Tennessee. Hey, Terry, how are you? Doing great. Excellent. And things are really great for you guys, but not everything goes well every time. Because, and you have a Halloween horror story. I do. This is terrible. I, I, I hate this story, but, um, but it's a good one. So, um, uh, rolled up on this house. Um, this is before I had an acquisitions rep. So I'm looking at this house myself. Um, uh, and I'm saying, okay, yeah, this house needs a lot of work, but it's got a brand new roof on it. Um, so that's a good start. Yeah. So, um, uh, so we proceed to do the rehab. Um, we, we rehab the entire house inside and out. Um, the furnace is located in a closet in the hallway. The water heater is located in the storage room outside as they are so many times in Memphis. And uh, when the rehab is completely done, uh, I come back through to do uh, what we call a blue tape walkthrough. Put yep. pieces of blue tape on stuff that just need tightening up a bit. And uh, I noticed the pull down attic 
steps, um, there was a, the cord on the pull down attic steps was just a little dingy. I'm like, okay, we need to replace that. And, um, uh, and I just, uh, I pulled it down to make sure we didn't need to replace the whole set of steps. Well, I hadn't gone up in the attic. And when I pulled down the attic steps, all I could see was, was black. And I'm thinking, okay, well, you know, maybe it's just, you need to turn, turn the light on up there. So I flipped the light switch and nothing came on. I go up there with a flashlight and the entire attic is a burnout. Oh, and wow. when I mean it's a burnout, I mean the rafters are so charred. The ridge beam is so charred. It's completely done. Oh no. And we have to decapitate the, the house. And when I mean decapitate the house, I mean the the ceiling joist. So we had to take down all of the oh, sheetrock, wow. all of the, the the whole deal. So you're standing in a completely rehabbed house and you look up and there's no obstruction but but there's just sky. So But a new roof over the top of that nicely burned out. Someone house. someone got me. They got me bad. Oh wow. All right. So here's the most important part of Halloween horror stories. What did you learn? What are the lessons? Man, look in the attic, look underneath the house, get in the storage room. Uh, so now my acquisitions team, uh, they, they know you gotta, you gotta look. All right. Good stuff. Well, great things are happening in Memphis. In fact, we're going to invite you back on the show. So in a few more weeks, uh, you'll get a chance to find out what's new with uh, Terry Kerr in Memphis, Tennessee, and to get some tips for happy tenants. So we'll look forward to that show. Sounds great. Our final spine chilling story for this year is not for the weak of heart. So be warned. It's called From Mayhem to Murder. <laughs> this one is a frightful one for sure. Please welcome back to the Real Estate Guys radio program, Sep Bacom. How are you, Sep? Good, Robert. How are you? It's always good to see you, my friend. You too. You're out there doing the thing, and it's awesome to watch. You've been an amazing student, but not everything always goes right, does it? No. <laughs> so tell us about this year's Halloween Horror Story. Sure. Uh, the interesting thing is I, uh, I've been an active real estate guys listener for the last six years. And I remember listening to the Halloween Horror Stories thinking I would never want to have a property <laughs> be on the show. And here I am. <laughs> well, sorry. And you're welcome. <laughs> So this particular property, uh, it was the first large apartment complex that I purchased. At the time, I was working as a full-time electrical engineer. Um, it was a 52-unit apartment complex in a major U.S. market. And we structured the deal creatively. Uh, it was 100% financing with us just paying for the commission for the real estate agents on the side. Wow. Uh, Value-add type deal. You know, there was, uh, th there was a little bit of hair on it. We had a, a smaller property on the same street for about a year, and that property was a small six-unit building, didn't really have any crime. That street is about one mile away from some mansions in this particular city, also about a mile and a half away from a very nice university and military base. So pretty, you know the market pretty well because you've been there a year and you have an opportunity to buy an obviously much bigger property. Okay, great. Right. We uh, had a property manager that was managing the six-unit building, and he would say, yeah, we can handle this. You know, We'll just do some renovations and, and get it turned around. So uh, did the walkthrough on the larger property, the 52 unit, uh, walked every apartment and uh, not, not anything major. I mean, we didn't see any machine guns or anything like that. So we figured, okay, this should be a good, good play. So uh, day one of closing, uh, we realized that the, uh, I mean, the property we knew was 50% occupied. Only half of those tenants were paying rent. So that was generating about $5,000 a month in rent. And the mortgage was $10,000 per month. And the first day we had a, uh, a break in into one of the new tenants uh, apartments and they moved out immediately afterwards. Within the uh, first five days, we realized that there were sex offenders living on the property. Shortly after that, we realized there was convicted felons, prostitutes. Wow. Yeah. This and, keeps getting better. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, all this time, I mean, we just uh, kept uh, doing one apartment at a time and doing what we could as, as the issues would rise up, but it didn't stop from there. We even had a former police officer move into one of the apartments and within the first week that they were there, uh, their apartment got broken into and they moved out immediately. Wow. So not even safe enough for the police to be living over there. Active gangs. Uh, there was one incident where one of the tenants tried to kill our maintenance guy on the property. He was hiding inside of an apartment and police couldn't obtain a warrant. So he was literally living there for two days and the police were kind of playing cat and mouse waiting for him to come out. All this, we expected it to be stabilized within six months, and it ended up taking about two years to stabilize. Police wouldn't go to the neighborhood unless there were two squad cars at the same time. There was even a point where we had uh, one of the drug dealers was involved in some uh, territory dispute, and we didn't know this until afterwards, but there were, uh, there were drive-by shootings occurring on the property. So the property manager at this time was kind of getting down to the, uh, the final hour, saying this, this might be a little bit too much or outside my expertise. 
Wow. So, so that's a lot. That's a lot. I mean, obviously there's ups and downs in, in property. That's a, that's a whole bunch. So, uh, is there any, uh, any silver, silver lining in this? Tell us, uh, tell us what happened. Uh, well, as the saying goes, it's always, uh, darkest just before the dawn, right? So the worst point of the property, uh, we want, we're onto our third property management company this time and we were making progress. We finally got the property up to 90% occupancy, but in one day we had a, a tenant fatality and it was drug related. And the shooter uh, basically came and uh, murdered the tenant in broad daylight. They left, the police were not able to catch them. And the property manager told me this while I was working at, uh, at my job. So I said, you should go check the news. Um, the property is on TV. And by the way, we quit. Uh, this is our 30 day notice. Oh man. And I, wait, I was literally begging the police chief to come over and put the police, uh, you know, provide some type of patrol. And they said that's security guards uh, job. So we had a security guard company come out there. And yes, it does get worse. Uh, oh no. At that point, uh, the police were still looking for the suspect. We had a security guard on the property. The tenants were frightened. The property manager wouldn't even go to the property to reassure the tenants because they were afraid it was going to be a PR nightmare. When the police left later that night and the, the suspect was still at large, there was a news crew that came out to the property and they were doing an interview. And then literally as the camera was recording, the suspect walks right behind the news camera and starts shooting at the television reporter and the television cameraman and starts having a gunfight with the security guard. And they broadcasted this video on nationwide news. So pretty scary. Wow. Yeah. So it's one thing to have your property in the paper or on the news, but the national news, that's kind of a big deal. Right. Wow. Okay. So what happens next? Even all this, uh, all these challenges that were, that were occurring, you know, we, we still have faith. We knew that, we, that there had to be a good property management company out there that can handle this. This was the worst property in a good neighborhood. So we just knew we had to find, you know, and keep pressing for that right team. Yeah. Um, even as we were going through all these challenges, I was still coming to all um, the real estate guys syndication seminars because I knew I could find other investors that were working on this type of property and had experience and could let me know, hey, you know, this is who you should be talking to and this is the type of management company that can help out with. Uh, fast forward, we were able to um, get rid of all the, the bad uh, tenants out of there, reduce the uh, crime in the neighborhood by 95%, get the occupancy up, you know, get cash flowing again, and um, actually have the police thank us afterwards saying, yeah, it's, you know, we don't have to have two police cars coming over here and patrolling at night anymore. The homeowners in the neighborhood loved it, and the tenants could finally go out at night and not worry about having any type of crime. It was, it was definitely a good learning experience realizing that it's one thing to just be reading the books, which we're still active readers, and there's another thing to actually go out and, and be at the seminar, meet the investors, and, and learn from the experts. You know, that's such a good point. Sometimes investing can be a lonely business. You're out there kind of on your own. Even if you raise money, and I know you do that for uh, investments, those folks are passive. They're not actively involved. They're not helping when times get tough. In this case, hats off because you've turned it into a stabilized performing property, which has benefited the entire neighborhood, not just you guys. But let's talk about some of the lessons that you learned going through this because it's always hindsight, right? You didn't see it at the time and, and many times you said, well, we didn't know this and, at then, right? And that's what happens in real estate, especially in markets that you're new into. You know, you knew the neighborhood because you'd had a property there, but obviously this property had its challenges. What are some of your lessons learned, Seb? Uh, definitely. And, and you guys talk about this at the syndication seminar. So this, this deal did have passive investors involved and I was the active syndicator. And as you guys teach, you know, it's, it's always good to keep the good communication line. So we didn't have just quarterly calls. We didn't have monthly calls or weekly calls. We had daily updates and sometimes it was multiple, well, multiple times during the days. Wow. Uh, so just you know, letting them know what's going on and um, and having their their input involved as well had had a had a big help with that. Okay, so stop there for a minute. That's on the investor side, managing your investors' expectations. They didn't expect it to be like this. Did you? You didn't expect it to be like this. But rather than put your head in the sand and and not contact them, you were proactive to to keep them up to speed. That's smart. And uh, and the other aspect of it was the team. And I can't take credit for that. Um, even though we've we've had five property management companies. Um, on this asset since acquisition, each time it was it was uh, it was improving. You know, the property was getting better, the tenant base was getting better, and the team, especially the team that we have now, they've done a phenomenal job. And and I realized that it's not just about the property or the number of doors or the roofs. It's you know who's the type of client that we're serving, who are we screening in, and how are we better serving the community? And that's that's what makes it worthwhile at the end. And the thing that jumps out at me is just perseverance, right? You didn't let the first problem throw you off. You right. didn't let it have you raise your hands up and say, forget it. We're out of here. We'll take a loss. You stuck with it, stuck to your gun, so to speak. And, uh, and now I guess this year the property is murder free. 
Yes. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Well, Sepp, uh, there's a ton in there, and uh, thanks for being uh, open enough to share with us. Congratulations, and, and uh, good luck. With any luck, we will have you back on Halloween Horror Stories because there's so much you can learn when things go wrong. Absolutely. Thank you, Robert. If you've been able to handle all of the fright dished out today, we're glad you're still with us. Oh my gosh, so fabulous to hear all the Halloween horror stories. I think, again, just looking at ways to glean lessons out of all of that, and of course the lessons were self-apparent as people uh, went through their process, but in a big picture, one of the things you look at is successful people really aren't afraid to talk about their setbacks. Uh, you think about all these people that we've just listened to that go through the process and, you know, we ask them, hey, would you like to be on this national radio show podcast thing and have hundreds of thousands of people hear about your failures? Yeah. Right. <laughs> I mean, how many people? Oh, yeah. Sign me up for that. Right. Right. But this is literally a give back. I mean, if you really think about it, you know, you go through a situation and you've learned a painful lesson and you think, OK, well, I paid full price for this lesson. I mean, I paid the full price and I got a great lesson and I'm better because of it. But I can actually get a higher return on that by sharing it with the rest of the world. And so the big picture of that is people like this who are successful, number one, have setbacks. So if you're having setbacks, that doesn't mean you're a loser. And number two, they have abundance. They think abundantly. They share the lessons. They're not afraid. They're not hiding behind their pride. Oh my God, I can't let anybody know I've had a failure. They'll, they'll never invest with me. Right. They'll never do a deal with me. I better not let my wife or my kids know because they won't respect me. See, that scarcity mindset, that's small thinking. You know, we talk openly about what we've been through. I think that's important. It's therapeutic, of course. But, you know, if you're just going to only look at the positive side of life, if you're only going to look at sunshine and unicorns, as we said at the top of the show, then you are really not going to be dealing with some of the reality realities. So a friend of ours has this concept about being brutally honest in your self-assessment. And it's the idea that you can't fix a problem you won't acknowledge. Just the very act of talking about the things that you've gone through or are going through, right? There's another thing. I've, I've watched people, family members, in fact, in fact, I've even done this myself, where I have been too prideful, too fearful to ask for help. People could help me, but I was embarrassed I even had the problem. And so rather than ask for help, I tried to solve the problem with inadequate resources. The problem swallowed me. And now my problem became public because everybody could see that I had a problem. Instead of taking it strategically to two or three trusted people who could help me and being vulnerable, I sat there in my pride and let the thing swallow me. And then the whole world got to see the disaster. So even in that, there's lessons. So there's, this is absolutely by far one of my favorite shows that we do every year because it is just so rich in lessons and really personal development and how you become a high achiever. So big, big thanks to the folks who were vulnerable enough to share their mishaps with us. And of course, to be able to steal those lessons, that's great stuff. It's not too early to submit a Halloween horror story for next year. If something bad has happened to you where you got an amazing lesson, just send an email to guys at realestateguysradio.com and let us know about your Halloween horror story. And who knows, maybe you'll show up on this program next year. Hey, next week on the show, it's one of our favorite shows. It's Ask the Guys. That's your questions and our answers. If you have a question to ask the Real Estate Guys, just go to our website at realestateguysradio.com and click the button that says Ask the Guys. Fire away. We get tons of great questions. And next week, lots of good answers. Until then, have a happy Halloween and go out and make some equity happen. This episode of the Real Estate Guys Radio Show is brought to you by Paradigm Life. Powerful cash management strategies using life insurance. Learn more at beyourbank.com. Mid-South Home Buyers, low-cost, turnkey cash flow properties in Memphis, Tennessee. Corporate Direct, asset protection strategies for real estate investors from attorney and rich dad advisor Garrett Sutton. Find these and other great companies under the Resources tab at realestateguysradio.com. To learn how you can expose your product or service to the Real Estate Guys audience, call 888-489-7723, extension 4. That's 888-489-7723, extension 4. Or use the feedback page at realestateguysradio.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week right here on the Real Estate Guys Radio Show.